The race in the EV stakes used to be more of a flat than a steeplechase. Back in 2010, it was really just Nissan with the first generation Leaf that was vying to be your firm favourite. However, since then, the market has been, well, almost a gallop with new models coming on stream, so all the way from super minis right up to luxury SUVs. But Nissan have been busy back in the stables and in 2017 launched the second generation Leaf. Last year, they included it with a bigger battery pack and more power. So, is it still one of your fun favourites or does a new breed of model make this a bit of an also run? Let's find out. <laughs> You know, it would be fair to say that the second generation Nissan Leaf looks a lot better than the first one did. But then my wife says that I look better with a beard than without one. It still doesn't make me George Clooney, however. Still, the car features the, the Nissan corporate nose and these striking LED headlights that sweep back into this front wing. It's quite a tall car too. I had the car parked next to a Mercedes E-Class at my daughter's school this morning and it seemed to tower above the German saloon car and it looks almost a little bit underwheeled. This car also features the dual tone paintwork, which is quite striking, helps give a bit of a lift. And also the rear light signature is now the new corporate sort of Nissan slash into the bodywork. The Leaf retains its practical five door layout and to all intents and purposes, it looks like a big roomy family car. A little bit like a Hyundai Ioniq, it's a curious size, not quite fitting neatly into one class of car or the other. And like I said, it's quite tall car for something that isn't a crossover SUV. The standard boot size is okay at 385 litres with the seats up in place. But on this Techno trim car, there's this Bose amplifier randomly positioned on the boot floor, which isn't the most practical place for it. And whilst the seats do actually split fold 60-40, when you fold one, you've got this massive step in height change. The Leaf comes with two battery sizes. It comes with the standard 40 kilowatt battery in lower trims, which should give a range of around about 168 miles. Or this car here, which is the Leaf Plus in Techno trim, which is a higher 62 kilowatt battery, which should give a range according to WLTP figures of around about 239 miles. Realistically, that's probably going to drop below 200 in colder months. You don't get CCS charging. Nissan still favouring the Chadimo style, which is a 50 kilowatt quick charge, but has a 100 kilowatt capability, meaning you can go from 20 to 80% in around 90 minutes. At home, from your 7 kilowatt wall box, you're looking at around 11 and a half hours. Now, this is longer than other cars take, and if I'm honest, Chadimo feels a little bit like a Betamax in the VHS world of CCS. There's quite a curious mix in here, actually. The dashboard itself, you've got this nice, clear, analogue speedometer on one side, and this configurable screen on the other. And you can scroll through various different bits and pieces. Your power readings, um, warning systems, um, what's on the audio system. And once you get used to it, it is very good. It's easy to read at a glance and it's nice enough and easy to use. Then we move on. The central infotainment system is a touch screen and whilst it could be a little bit sharper, it is fit for purpose. The card also features our standard Android Auto and Apple CarPlay and they work particularly well. And then there's the actual equipment level on this Tecna trim car. It's just huge. You get um, heated steering wheel, heated seats front and rear. You get Nissan's Pro Pilot which is lane departure, adaptive headlights, parking assist, um, adaptive cruise control. We've also got Bluetooth, privacy glass, the list just goes on. And yet the steering column only adjusts the one way, which is for height. It doesn't adjust for reach. And whilst you've got reasonable adjustment of the seats, it's manual adjustment, not electric. Then there's the design of it all. Some of the switch gear looks okay. You've got these relatively nice soft touch buttons here, but then you've got these clunky things here that look like they've come out of a 1989 Nissan Patrol. There's just no cohesion to it. And also, can someone tell me why these column stalks are at different heights and different angles? It just feels all a bit odd to me. And then there's the seats themselves. Now, they're actually quite comfortable, especially for a longer drive, but on this Tecna trim model, there's this half leather, half suede. 
And to be honest with you, the leather is just ghastly. It's harder and scratchier than some of the plastics on the switches. There's also a little bit of lack of under thigh support because there's no tilt adjustment on the seat. What I will say, however, is the build quality is fantastic. I mean, this particular press car has done nigh on 10,000 miles. And let's be honest, that's going to be quite a hard 10,000 miles. And yet there's not a squeak or a rattle present. Also as well, on longer journeys, wind noise and amb ambient cabin noise is kept to a minimum. The rear seats sit quite high and have got a huge amount of padding in them, which on a positive note means that the rear occupants have a good view forward. Um, there's two isofix points on the outer seats, but this middle part, a middle part of the seat isn't going to be particularly comfortable for anyone that is, that is of adult size. And also there's this curious transmission tunnel down here. What is very, very odd, however, and um, it's obviously due to the back of the batteries are underneath the car, is that the floor is quite squashed into the roof, so my feet are really squashed under the front seat. And I'm not particularly tall, and my head is quite close to the roof of the car. I think anybody approaching six foot or over is going to find it quite uncomfortable for anything but short journeys. The Leaf E Plus produces around 240 brake horsepower, so it can be quite sprightly. 60 miles an hour from rest comes up in just under 7 seconds, so it does pick up its kimono and shift itself. It's also quite pleasant on a longer drive. As I said, it's got quite a nice sort of refined, quiet feel to it, so longer journeys are quite, quite nice. And on a motorway, gaps are kind of filled quite easily with just a, a slight press of the throttle. The steering's okay, it's light enough at parking speeds, it weights up on the move. The only downside is in cornering, there is quite a lot of body roll because the car is quite tall, so therefore it's quite pronounced when you pitch it into a corner. And that's despite the batteries being quite low down. The braking system as well is quite good. Um, you've got Nissan's e-pedal fitted to the car. Now the brake regeneration on the Leaf is operated through this slightly stubby transmission lever down here where you go from park, reverse and drive. You can move it across from the D position back into B and that gives you a sort of slightly um, softer form of regen. But then there's a separate button over here called the e-pedal and that turns the car into, effectively, you can drive it in town just using the one pedal. Now, it's quite startling at first because it really decelerates the car as soon as you lift off the throttle. But actually, once you get used to it, it's quite nice. Um, yeah, it's quite easy to use, but it does take quite a bit of getting used to it because it's quite startling at first. And of course, the other thing you get with a lot of these EVs is the Derrigar Eco button, which goes you from normal to eco. Um, and this is obviously designed to eke out every last mile on the car and it shuts a lot of the systems down and it, the only problem with it is it really deadens the throttle pedal to the point you're really wondering whether or not how far you've got to push it to make the car go like everything else to be honest with you for the benefit it gives you i would just leave it off Again, as we've seen with a lot of the other EVs recently, where the car is really let down is its wide quality. Now on nice smooth surfaces, the dampers do a relatively good job and the ambient noise from outside is kept low because of the refinement, so the car is quite smooth. It's only when you start to get onto slightly broken surfaces that it just starts to get a little bit confused about what it's meant to be doing. It doesn't seem neither fish nor fowl, this car. It's not dynamic enough to be sporty and it's not comfortable enough to be, well, comfortable if I'm being honest with you. The brakes as well, they need a little bit of a, a firm push. The initial bite just isn't really there. You've got to really, really get down on the pedal before the car starts to slow up. Now, you've also got brake regeneration, as is mostly the case with EVs, and there's effectively two settings of it. It's controlled through this slightly stubby transmission lever down here. When you're in drive, you can then bring it back into B mode, a bit like the Renault Zoe that we had before. That's the sort of lowest um, part of its brake regeneration, or its softest setting. Nissan also then offer you this, called the E-pedal. Now, when you press that, that really gives its highest, most aggressive setting for the brake regeneration. It's quite startling at first, but once you get used to it, through town certainly, it makes the car really easy to drive, certainly just using the one pedal. 
get get used to it because actually the benefits are there. There is no getting away from this, so I'm just going to have to say it relatively quickly. This car we have here today is £37,145. That is after the government grant of £3,000, which is current at time of filming. And to be honest with you, I'm sorry, but that is just way too much money for this car. The leaf range does start at just over £26,000 for the lower powered 40 kilowatt battery Accenta trim. And at that level, it's a little bit more palatable. At £37,000, the Nissan Leaf E in Tecna trim is come up, coming up against some pretty serious contenders for the money. Obviously, we've got the Hyundai Kona Electric and Kia e Nero twins, which, dare I say, for the same money, offer a better range and a better drive. If you're looking at a similar size of car and style, then you've got your Hyundai Ioniq at much less money. And not to mention the brilliant MG ZS at a whopping £12,000 less, albeit with less range and spec. If you want something that's a bit more style and fun, then you've got the BMW i3, one of our favourite cars and still a real contender in the marketplace. Where it gets really, really difficult is that for just over £40,000, the Model 3 Tesla is tantalizingly close. And in comparison with the Leaf, that's gonna feel like the Millennium Falcon. Bearing in mind also, you've also got access to Tesla's supercharging network, obviously at a cost, but even so, it's a tempting proposition at this level of price in the marketplace. So here's what we like and we don't like about the Nissan Leaf E Plus. We like the added range of the E Plus model over the standard car its build quality, the refined driveline, and it's well equipped. We don't like it feels dated in certain areas of the cabin. The ride quality, rear seat space for what is quite a large car, boot space and awkward load space, and the fact that it offers quite bad value for money. It's just too expensive. You know, whenever a new press car arrives with me, I grab the keys and go out for that quick 10 minute drive just to get a flavour for it and then over the next few days I, I slowly evaluate it and see what the car's really like. I hate to say it, I didn't really do that with the Leaf. I had pretty much the measure of it within that first 10 minutes. It's the car as a domestic appliance. In other words, it does the job it's designed to do. It's not that the Leaf is a bad car, far from it. For some people, it's been a very good car and will continue to be so. It's just that for me, it's just not good enough, especially at £37,000, where there is a huge amount of better talent out there. Maybe it's further down the Leaf range at that £26,000 bracket where it makes a bit more sense, albeit it will be up against things as good as the MG ZS and its French cousin, the Renault Zoe. You know, maybe with hindsight, if Nissan had put this drivetrain into something as popular as, say, the Nissan Qashqai or, or its Duke little crossover, then it'd be a different outcome. But as it stands, in this race, the Leaf finishes it very handicapped indeed. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again soon. So, you've watched our video. It's now my job to tell you to like and subscribe, and press the little bell button to receive notification of when our next video is uploaded. Sorry, what's that? You want more than just videos? Okay, did you know that Auto EV is also a website? That's right, autoev.co.uk. Not only is it all the latest news, reviews and musings, including motorsport from the electric vehicle world, but we've got literally hundreds of used electric vehicles for sale from dealers up and down the country. 